The attacks on Paris and Beirut have shone a harsh lens on how the West has handled ISIS and growing radicalization. It's a subject dominating conversations around the globe and a conversation we followed here at the agenda. And so tonight, three discussions that provide context to these tragedies. Discussions on war, on terror, and on conflicts at home. That's all tonight on the agenda. Funding for The Agenda with Steve Pagan is provided by Ontario's more than 80,000 chartered professional accountants. Public policy leaders since 1879. More information is available at cpaontario.ca. And by contributions to TVO by viewers like you. Thank you. As coalition forces bombard ISIS strongholds, we bring you a conversation from September 2014 that examines the international fight against ISIS and considers the effectiveness of U.S. President Barack Obama's strategy to degrade and destroy the terrorist group. Here is that discussion. Joining us now for more on the changing developments in this story in Washington, D.C. via Skype, Hussein Ibish, Senior Fellow at the American Task Force on Palestine. In Cambridge, Massachusetts via Skype, MIT Professor Barry Posen, author of Restraint, A New Foundation for U.S. Grand Strategy. Back here at our studios, TVO's foreign affairs analyst Janice Stein, now the director of the Monk School of Global Affairs, at least for a few more months anyway, and Kamran Bukhari, Middle East advisor for Stratfor and author of Political Islam in the Age of Democratization. And it's good to have you two here in the studio and our two friends on the line from the United States. Is it possible to do what the president said, namely degrade and ultimately destroy ISIS? Uh, in theory, it is possible, and perhaps in the long run, it may be achievable, but it's going to take a while. And when I say a while, uh, we're not talking years. We're probably talking, you know, decades, because it's not just destroying ISIL. You can destroy something, then something else pops up. Hmm. It's about creating a new framework for Syria. We have a framework of sorts in Iraq, but we need a new framework for, for Syria in order to prevent non-state actors from exploiting the vacuum. That requires not just working with Arab states, that requires working with Turkey, working with Iran, uh, making sure that uh, you know, all the stakeholders are taken on board. The question is, and of course there's, there's Israeli security as well over there. Mind you that the, uh, the Golan area in Syria uh, is in a, a base of activity for the Al-Qaeda branch called mm -hmm. al-Nusra, of course, in alliance with other factions, but nonetheless, Israel has a say in it as well. So the question is, how do you bring Israel, Iran, Turkey, the Arab states, and say, okay, let's find a solution that's acceptable to everybody and basically satisfies everybody's security interests? President also said, no boots on the ground. Said he was elected actually to get America out of wars in the region, not put them mm -hmm. into wars in the region. Is that a commitment he should have made, Janice? I think he had no choice politically uh, but to make it because, uh, first of all, domestic politics matter in every country. They matter in the United States. Uh, it's an election year. No president in September could, in a mid right before midterm elections, say they're going to be boots on the ground unless it was an obvious catastrophe for the United States. So I think he had no choice. But I also think that's probably right. Steve, you know, we can agree, Khamen and I, and Hussein can agree, that there is a significant threat to the broader national interests of the United States, but still argue that you need a strategy of containment first, long mm. before you get to destroy. You know, the Soviet Union, arguably, was a threat to the United States' core national interests, but we pursued a strategy of containment very successfully over a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. If the United States can use its air power in support of um, fundamentally Arab forces, Turkish forces, Kurdish forces on the ground, that is likely to be a far more effective strategy than American boots on the ground. Barry Posen, do you agree? <laughs> containment first, uh, eventually destruction? Well, I, I agree with the containment first. In other words, to the extent that um, the United States has some interest in the region, and they do. Uh, rotate around, uh, mainly around oil, um, the threat is rather limited. I mean, the, the, uh, the ISIL 
is would require an enormous increase in its capabilities to be able to actually threaten oil fields in the in the Gulf area. Enormous in, increase in its capabilities to conquer Kurdistan, to conquer Turkey, to conquer Jordan. That said, it's not to say it's not a problem at all. It's intelligent for the regional states to do what they can to, to contain ISIL. It's intelligent for the United States to help them contain ISIL. But the, the real rub is the question of what can be done if the president's objective and the objective of others in the region to destroy ISIL is to be realized. And this is incredibly difficult to do without ground forces. And it's incredibly difficult once you ejected ISIL from their main areas of of, of strength to keep them suppressed. I mean, people have to understand this is a two-step war. First, it would involve destroying what what normal conventional fighting power ISIL has, and then it would demand a counterinsurgency against ISIL's presence throughout that area. So this is a very difficult security problem. It would require lots of ground forces. And the last time the Americans tried this, they weren't all that successful. I mean, I think it's pretty clear that though the surge achieved a kind of a, 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 an enforced peace in Iraq, it did not destroy al-Qaeda in Iraq. ISIL are, are the sons of, of al-Qaeda in Iraq. So this idea that we have a way to destroy ISIL through offensive military action using either the forces in the region or our own forces is probably wrong. The smarter thing to do is to try and help the locals contain ISIL and then wait, watch as they alienate the people who, over whom they've established overlordship and as those people begin to get the will to oppose them, at which point those people can be helped. This is from Stratfor. This George Friedman wrote this. This is your organization, Kamram. He wrote this in a recent essay, Your Boss. There is a tactic that will succeed, the United States making it clear that while it might aid the pacification in some way, the responsibility is on regional powers. The solution rests in doing as little as possible and forcing regional powers into the fray, then in maintaining the balance of power in this coalition. Hussein, it's not often that you hear somebody recommending a foreign policy approach as do as little as possible. Yeah. Do you think that's the right approach? <clears throat> Actually, we do have voices like that in Washington, and we do hear from them quite a lot. Do as little as possible is pretty popular, especially in the, the post-Iraq and Afghanistan and um, financial meltdown era. So it's, it's not that much of a voice in the wilderness. Um, it probably should be more. I, I don't get it. Um, the United States is a regional power in the Middle East. It's a global power, but it's also a regional power in the Middle East. And I think leaving it entirely up to uh, states that we have asserted we are kind of the, the, the leader of and, and the bringer together of um, is, 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 is a, it's an odd notion because, it, you know, it, it sort of posits that if the United States takes the lead, that will kind of ensure that, that um, the policy won't work. I think there's a great deal of mixing apples and oranges here. To, to say that, for example, uh, there have been 15 years of American efforts, as, as Professor Walt was quoted just now, 15 years of efforts to do things in the Middle East, most of which have failed. Therefore, this won't work. Um, it, it, it just is a kind of non sequitur. This is very different. I, I, I mean, you've never it's seen... It's not a non sequitur because this is the same. Wait, We're it talking is very about regrooving the no. politics of Iraq. This no. is the no, wait, wait, wait. You, you have not, you've never seen four or, or five, if you like, but certainly four Arab states come together with the United States and bomb another Arab state. I mean, that's quite unprecedented in the history of the contemporary Middle East. And, you know, there's a, a, a function here. You were very sanguine about, about ISIL, but you're wrong about it. Uh, two years ago, if you had said that uh, the su successors of al-Qaeda in Iraq would be ruling Mosul, people, I think, would have laughed at you. There is a narrative force behind this group, and there is a, a kind of an ideological momentum that really does need to be broken here. Okay, uh, let me, let me give Barry Posen very, a chance to respond. This argues for containment, it doesn't argue for liberation. Yeah, well, Barry Posen, could fine, you respond? I don't disagree with containment. Hang on, gentlemen, we're, you're both speaking once and I'm, I'm not able to hear. Barry Posen, please respond to what you just heard Hussein Ibish put forward. Well, I mean, the, I mean if you look carefully at, at, at the, the stated strategy, it's to, it's, it's, to, it's to destroy ISIL. And the only way to destroy ISIL is to push it out of the areas that it has is, it is occupied. And as I understand it, there's six or eight million Sunni Arabs living on both sides of the Syrian and Iraqi borders who are now living under ISIL control. Some of those people actually support ISIL's purposes. Some of them have allied themselves with ISIL. Many of them oppose the Syrian government, and many more of them oppose the present Iraqi government. So the problem is not just beating ISIL's um, conventional fighting power, their trucks with machine guns and whatnot on them. The problem is establishing governance. Sure. The problem is, is establishing a legitimate, respected security force. Yeah. And this is something that the United States can't do for 
It's oh, something can, that the can take. Can't. You can play a major role. It's, the United it's States can't. Something that the Baghdad government uh, can't do. We, the we, United States can play uh, can definitely play a major role with its allies in creating. And I, here's where I think we agree. Now let me let me find a point of convergence here, if I may, uh, which is uh, it's implicit in what you're saying that the the main force that will ultimately bring down ISIL in the areas where they rule is local forces, and I would say local Sunni Arab forces is not going to be. Um, global ones like the United States, and it won't be um, groups that are perceived as, as having sectarian leadership uh, representing a sectarian Iraqi government in Baghdad or um, al-Assad and his sectarian Alawite-led government in uh, Damascus. It's going to be local Sunni Arabs in the areas of Iraq and Syria that, that um, ISIL is currently ruling over. I think we agree on that. The question is, do outsiders have a stake? And can they play a role in making that happen? And I think the answer clearly is yes. The do nothing or do as little as possible idea is just bizarre. Okay, let's get this some is wisdom in Toronto here. Let me, let me, jumping in here, I want to hear what, because you, you've, you've both laid out your positions, and now Janice and Kamran, I want to hear what you have to say on this. I don't want to disappoint my two friends south of the border, but I don't think there's much disagreement here. There's a lot of rhetoric, but there's not right. much disagreement. Well, hang disagreement. on. One, one side says don't, don't get involved very no. much at all. The other side says get no, involved no, no, big no. time. Barry said containment is a reasonable strategy. Uh, Hussein is actually saying containment because ultimately it's going to be local forces that are going to take on ISIS. And so there, there's more there's more agreement around certainly what the near-term strategy looks like around this table than there is disagreement. What is, it, it's not the first time, by the way, that oh, Hussein, as you well know, that our forces have gone engaged in a coalition from the air. They did in 1991. Um, when Saddam uh, invaded Kuwait. What is different, however? That was the coalition George Bush, the father, put together. That's right. Here's what's different, and we haven't talked about this. Obama led this coalition from behind. He did not lead it from in front. He was pushed by the United Arab Emirates and by the Saudis. Um, and and the, I've never heard in all my years in the Middle East apocalyptic language from, the, from those members of the Gulf, not Qatar, but from those members of the Gulf. What kind of language? It was the United States is vanishing. The United States is abandoning his allies. The United States is absent. Obama is a catastrophe. The, the rhetoric and the... Um, they said the, this publicly or privately? Well, they can't, they're very, you well, know... They, it was public. It was public. Op-eds in the New York Times. Absolutely, yeah. it was public. And it was in all kinds of private conversations as well. So, uh, in, in some sense, the, the dynamics are very different here. George Bush assembled that coalition, but he was pushed by Margaret Thatcher. Obama assembled this coalition, but he was pushed by Sunni Arab governments in the Gulf who see this as the, the last chance that the United States has to reestablish its credibility with Sunnis across the region. Come now, on. that's hard to do, but that's the stakes. Mm -hmm. I, I don't think any one of us disagrees that the United States and, and global powers, you know, international actors, extra-regional actors, don't have a role. They do have a role. Uh, the, the issue is let's, the regional actors, and I think that's what George was saying in his, in his piece. Is that, and it's not just Sunni Arabs. This is George Friedman. Had George Friedman, Friedman yes. Sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, and so um, it's not just Sunni Arab actors. There's Turkey in there as well. As I said earlier, Israel has interests. Mm -hmm. But the one power that everybody's sort of skirting around is Iran. And, and Iran has interests in Syria. It's not going to give up without a fight. Hezbollah is in, in, involved directly in that military conflict. Mm -hmm. And let's just take this, let's forget about the Shia right now, I just wanted to footnote that. We can talk about it later, but let's talk about the Sunnis. I mean, who are the Sunni allies that we have on the ground in Syria? I'm not talking about the state actors doing the bombing. What is UAE and Saudi Arabia doing in Jordan and everybody else? The same airstrikes. Some of them are supporting actors, many of them, if, uh, mm -hmm. in fact, uh, who are you know, only X degrees separated from the ideology of IS. And so, to say that there will that you know you need regional forces, Sunni forces, or even Shia, you have to first take a look at who are your potential allies. The bombing that has uh, continued since the air campaign was started has already created a, a realignment, and that realignment is a lot of those forces hate IS, but they don't want to join the U.S. coalition to fight IS because it puts them in a strategic dilemma, and they don't really think a whole lot differently than IS. Well, that's one of the conundrums. Barry Posen, come on in here and talk to us about another one of the conundrums, which is 
that Saudi Arabia, which can't stand IS, but whose Wahhabist faction within its kingdom is partially responsible for the extremism demonstrated by IS, how do we get our heads around all these different conundrums in the Middle East right now? Well, I think the United States has to um, basically have some priorities here. The first thing we have to understand is that pretty much every group and every state in that region is out for itself. And when they complain that the Americans aren't doing enough, what they usually mean is the Americans aren't doing enough for them. Now, to me, it's quite noteworthy that Saudi Arabia, UAE, um, uh, Jordan, these countries have agreed to cooperate against ISIL in Syria. They've offered no help in Iran, none whatsoever. And the reason they were offering to cooperate in Syria is because they want to get the Americans involved ultimately in overthrowing Assad. And it's going to be very, very difficult for the Americans to practice this very fine-tuned strategy that only focuses on ISIL but doesn't somehow help the Assad regime. And therefore, the Americans immediately face pressure to attack the Assad regime. So we have to understand that, that, that these actors are taking the opportunity of ISIL successes in Iraq to get us to do things that they've long ordered us to do, which is to try and get into the Syrian war and, and help assist factions that they, they like. Now, there's other issues that we have to sort out, right, where the Americans continue to insist that counterproliferation against Iran is a very important um, objective. Well, counterproliferation against Iran will contradict cooperation with Iran against Saudi Arabia. The Americans claim that they have to oppose Assad because we, have, we were for democracy and against autocracy. But to do that, we have to align ourselves with Saudi Arabia, Another which is a conundrum. Yeah. Well, well, wait we a second. Align, but is that true? I mean, we have to align ourselves with the Egyptians who basically came to power in a murderous coup d'etat in which they killed a thousand people in one night and have now managed to stimulate in this Islamist based insurgency in the Sinai against themselves. So there's all these con was deep contradictions in U.S. policy in this region. And the Americans probably, even given their great power, have to at least make some choices about what it is they want to do. Okay, let's yeah, get Hussein I, in. Hussein, your I, response? Well, I, I wouldn't really begin, I, I wouldn't know where to begin to pick apart all the things that I thought was wrong, fa even factually wrong with, with some of those uh, assertions. But the biggest one, the most glaring, I think, misinterpretation that we just heard that I'd like to challenge is the idea that the reason that Saudi Arabia, Jordan, uh, Bahrain, and uh, the UAE were willing to take kinetic action in Syria is because they were trying to snooker the United States into getting involved in a war against uh, al-Assad. Now, I actually think overthrowing Assad is going to be crucial to the battle against ISIS and crucial to the long-run stability of, of the region. He can't stay after what's happened. But I think the reason why that they are not offering uh, or being asked to take part in action in Iraq is not that they don't care about Iraq or they only care about al-Assad, but that Assad doesn't get to tell anybody what can happen in Syria anymore, whereas the Iraqi government is part of this coalition that those five Arab states are also part of as well. So I think for, you know, to have a third party other than the United States, which has been invited to take kinetic action in Iraq, uh, to have other states that maybe don't have the same relationship with Baghdad, such as the Saudis, invited to bomb Iraq by the Iraqi government is a, is a very big stretch here. And I think what is missing as well is the, an understanding that by bringing the Saudis and the uh, Emiratis and others into this coalition with the Iraqi government, and by the way, the Saudis may be preparing to reestablish their embassy in Baghdad, it's actually a very good thing because it's cutting uh, against the purely sectarian strain that has been very worryingly coming to dominate okay. Middle East regional politics. And so I think that's what's really behind the Syria, not Iraq thing. It's not anti-Assad hysteria. It's the realities of the Iraqi government. Kamran Bukhari. Uh, I, I, I admire Hussein's work, and I follow it quite regularly, but I'm going to have to respectfully disagree. If you topple the Assad regime while you're still fighting, you meaning who? We, yeah, we, the whole the world, coalition. the coalition, sorry. <laughs> if we do that, and then what we are unleashing is a vacuum. Even now, this strategy depends upon U.S. air power and allied air power coming in, softening up IS, creating a vacuum that hopefully, hopefully, moderate rebels will go in and fill. We don't, we can't control that. We don't know who's moderate. 
You know, we, we, we have no uh, uh, way of telling how moderate one group is from the other. On paper, everything looks nice. Does such a thing exist in Syria, moderate rebels? I mean, in a, in a conflict that's geosectarian in nature, I mean, moderation was out the window a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we, we, we can, uh, while we're doing that, and then somehow the Assad regime is to be toppled while we don't have another framework. I mean, look at Iraq. We have a framework. It is called the Iraqi government. It doesn't work. It works somewhere in between. But even, and I will agree with uh, Hussein that Saudi Arabia is supportive of that, uh, but there is a consensus there that you need to bring the Sunnis back away from IS towards this, uh, they become stakeholders in the system. You don't have that in Syria. You don't have, uh, you're creating a bigger vacuum if you go from I, uh, IS or even IS at the same time as the Assad regime. I mean, that's, that's going to be a disaster. Let me thank uh, Janice and Kamran for being here in the studio. Hussein, I want to thank you for being on the program sure again thing. and remind everybody that you were actually up here with us uh, in Toronto not too long ago. And I say that because, uh, Barry Posen, uh, we want to make sure that next time you are up here in Toronto, you make sure you let us know because we'd love to have you on the set and uh, we can pick up on where the conversation left off. Thanks very much, everybody, for joining us tonight on TVO. Thanks, Steve. Up next, a life once radical reformed. Author Majid Nawaz, right after this. There was a time when Majid Nawaz was an Islamic extremist. After an arrest and soul-searching time, he emerged reform. Joining us now for more on his journey, Majid Nawaz. Author of Islam and the Future of Tolerance, he's also the chairman of Quilliam, a think tank that challenges the narratives of extremism. And we welcome you to this side of Thank the you. pond from your home in the United Kingdom. It's a pleasure being here. Thank Can you. we show you a very funny picture to start with? You want to put this up, please? Where look, on, look on the monitor up there. Oh, my God. <laughs> Someone's done their research. That's you on the right, yeah. decked out in your hip-hop gear. Yeah. You were, uh, you were a bit of a bad boy back then growing up in Essex, Southeast England. Mm. And as you put it in your memoir, uh, <laughs> from hip hop loving teenager in Essex to traveling to four different countries to seed my divisive Islamist message, casting America as the enemy of quote, my people. Mm. Fusing faith with fury, I dedicated my entire youth to awakening what we call the sleeping giant, rousing the world's 1.5 billion Muslims against the USA. Yeah. What did joining a radical Islamist group do for you personally as a kid? What it did for me on a personal level was give me a sense of identity, a sense of belonging where I hadn't felt that I belonged in Essex where I was born and raised, um, a sense of empowerment. Uh, in, in many instances, these are false senses, of course. They, you know, they, uh, identity is, is by, but it's very nature, it's complex, it's multiple. It should be and it must be multiple. Um, but I, I, as an angry young 16-year-old, took a very simplistic view on identity and, and called, considered myself exclusively a Muslim and nothing else. Uh, or this false sense of empowerment, feeling like anger and hate and bitterness towards others is empowering, is a false sense of empowerment, but nevertheless was meaningful to me as a 16-year-old. Um, in many ways, my journey through Islamism has... Uh, there, are some, there are some lessons that I still keep with me today. Um, I spent a lot of time having to convince people of ideas that were inherently difficult to convince people of. Mm. And so a lot of that training has remained with me till uh, today as well. Why was there nothing scary about Islamism at the time that didn't deter you from diving in deeper? So let's keep in mind that we're talking now here, when I joined uh, the revolutionary Islamist group I did, it was 1993, or f two or three roughly, or four. Those, those early 90 uh, years. So we're well before the Twin Towers yeah, and all of that. We're business. well before yeah. uh, Al Qaeda. What we're looking at is, in fact, Rambo uh, going to Afghanistan, calling the Mujahideen heroes because they're fighting the Soviet Union. What we're looking at um, are British Muslims joining uh, British armed forces in Bosnia uh, to defend Serbian, uh, Bosnian Muslims from the Serbian uh, per 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 perpetuated genocide. So uh, individual fighters who are non-state actors were freely able to go abroad and fight and, and return, and they were hailed as heroes. So it's, that's the, to set that context and that scene, um, it's, it's, it, was a, it was a very different time to what we found with the formation of Al-Qaeda and, and the 9-11 attacks afterwards. But the religious obligations of Islamism, were you not deterred by any of that? Um, I had never been religious and I found to be 
And to be honest with you, I found that the most difficult part because as, mm -hmm. as uh, you've alluded to in my book, uh, the first section of which uh, is called B-Boy, um, I had a, a, an interesting lifestyle prior to joining Hizbut Tahrir mm -hmm. and uh, I had to give up a lot of things. And, and to my eternal regret, one of the biggest mistakes I made is I gave away an incredibly rare collection of uh, hip hop vinyl, uh, uh, which you can't get your hands on these days. And I gave it away for free. And if I ever find the person to whom I gave that to, I'm going to demand it back. You but want it back. I, I desperately want Let's it see. back. Yeah. What was uh, the radical group that you joined? I'm not going to say it well, but Hizb ut Tahir? Hizb ut Tahrir, you can call it HT as a short for ac the acronym. HT. Yeah. Did you have a particular role in this group? I joined as a recruit, but I eventually ended up on the leadership committee of this organization and uh, was responsible for exporting and founding franchises uh, from Britain in Pakistan, in Denmark, and eventually in Egypt. How, okay, Egypt. You ended up in prison in Egypt. Yeah. How did that happen? I arrived, so fast forward from me joining uh, 10 years later, I arrived in Egypt um, uh, ostensibly for my studies. I was studying law and Arabic at the University of London. There's a picture of you. Uh, that's right, that's my mugshot, actually, um, mm. in Mazrat or a prison in Cairo. And uh, I arrived in Egypt one day before the 9-11 attacks. Mm. And of course, the entire world changed after then. And I wasn't uh, prepared for the way in which the security climate would change. So 10 months roughly after my arrival, I was arrested by the Egyptian state security. I was blindfolded. I had my hands tied behind my back uh, with rags. And I was taken to their dungeons in Cairo, in a building known as al Gihaz, uh, where they began torturing everyone uh, via electrocution. Do you, if you don't want to, it's OK. But do you want to be more specific about what they did to you then? So uh, I got away without being electrocuted. Uh, what they did instead, as, aside from the beatings, which were nothing in comparison to what they were doing to others, they were torturing people uh, by electrocuting their teeth and their genitalia. And they were forcing me to watch that and then asking me questions off the back of that. And the reason I got away is still a mystery to me because uh, it wasn't because I was British. They tortured a British citizen, my fellow inmate, in front of me uh, and, uh, and, and you know, played our questions off each other. So they had actually, they, they, they threatened me. They said, we will do the same to you in 12, uh, within 12 hours if you don't confess to everything. Confess to what? Uh, coming to Egypt to uh, work for HT, my organization, uh, and uh, working to resurrect a caliphate in Egypt. Um, Neither of which were actually your goals, I'm gathering. Uh, well, I was actually recruiting for the organization, uh, but I wasn't there in Egypt for that purpose. Hmm. Um, but within, within the 12 hours, the embassy had intervened, and this is four days later. But, but uh, the 12-hour window they'd given me, within that, the embassy intervened and got us out of the torture dungeons and into solitary confinement, where we spent the next four months. Eventually, we were sentenced to five years in, in Mazrat or a prison, which is where that mugshot was taken that you showed on, on the screen. How old were you at the time? Uh, 24 years old. Did you think you were going to die? Yes. And then comes George Orwell's Animal Farm. Indeed. How did that influence your life at this moment? You see, Orwell's genius is, uh, I think, we, we're yet to, we're yet to, it's yet to be matched in the way in which he takes uh, or took um, writing and uh, political subjects and uh, was able to write in, through fiction, really meaningful and timeless works. If, if you look at 1984 today, uh, and if you look at Animal Farm today, you change the theme from communism to uh, jihadist terrorism, and it's the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, how I felt I, I was living in, uh, in Egypt in, in prison, I felt I was living in the jihadist equivalent of Orwell's Animal Farm. You know, the, the pigs had w started walking on hind legs and they were running the show. In, in that block, the cell block we were in, the jihadists were running the show. And it was the first time I'd come up close and lived with, in proximity to, those who, whom I had uh, lionized growing up. Uh, people I considered heroes. And I was finally living with them. And I came to see their mannerisms, their behavior, uh, their ideas up close and implemented on the rest of the, uh, or their cellmates in, in that cell block. And I came to the conclusion, and this is long before ISIS declared a, uh, the so-called caliphate, I came to the conclusion if these people ever come to power, it will be hell on earth. Uh, we were having conversations about slavery and its legitimacy, uh, debates uh, around amputation of limbs and, and stoning adulteresses. And in, in a way, I, I really didn't want to live in that type of place. Um, and so when I uh, finished my sentence and I was released from prison, I not only left uh, Hizbut Tahrir, but I decided to dedicate the rest of my time and energies in challenging what I now consider and call the Islamist ideology as distinct from Islam and faith. As you look at yourself now, you are an elegantly dressed man. It's very kind of you to say. Uh, well, I'm just telling it like it is. Idris Elba should be worried. <laughs> yes. The next James Bond. Yeah. Uh, do you sometimes look back and say, what was I thinking then? Or do you ever put yourself in the headspace of the young teenager and think, look at what I have turned into now. I never would have seen that coming either. Well, I certainly wouldn't, seen, I wouldn't have seen any of this coming. Um, 
Though in a sense, there's a continuum throughout my entire life. Uh, even though in Radical, in the book, uh, there are three sections, B-boy um, and, and, uh, and Islamist, and then the third section I call Radical, which is how I describe myself now. Um, though they are three very different lives, and, and the book begins with that contrast, uh, uh, basically uh, contrasting three very different scenes from my life, it could look as if they are three different people. But actually, there is a strand that runs through consistently um, throughout my life. One is an anger at injustice and a desire to speak out against it. What's changed is my understanding of what injustice is. Um, my understanding that, in fact, uh, the Nietzschean beast that we were trying to fight, you know, we, we, we became that beast ourselves as Islamists. And my desire to speak out against injustice, as well as applying to the Guantanamos of, of this world and of extraordinary rendition and torture and profiling, has now extended also to the Islamist ideology. So in that sense, there's a continuing strand. And also, actually, from the picture you showed of me when I was young, my, my, my love for, um, let's just put it this way, uh, fashion tastes back then, <laughs> wearing red bandanas and red click suits, I mean, that's continued throughout as well. So I think there are some, you know, and, and, and my, my love for music is, is still there as well. Islam and the Future of Tolerance, that's the uh, upcoming book, Dialogue Between You and Sam Harris, the well-known atheist. Uh, why don't we start with this? How would you characterize the kind of conversation that the two of you are having in this book? A dialogue is the best word for it, and it's respectful, it's civil. Um, we take some very, very tricky subjects. You know, if you ever go to dinner, they say never, on the dinner table, never discuss religion or politics. And you do both. And, and it's our job to do yeah. both. I mean, this is actually everything I do is discuss religion and politics. And so it's very difficult to have that conversation in a way that doesn't anger all of the pe some of the people all of the time. Um, and so the, the beautiful thing with this particular conversation is it remained civil. Um, and there were certain moments where it could have turned into something else. Uh, sometimes he was pushing my buttons on something, or I was pushing his well, buttons. Well, let me pick one. Yeah. There's a moment where he, you say Islam is a religion of peace, mm -hmm. and he thinks, well, mm -hmm. not exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, so I, my, my view, actually, I come to that conclusion, but not because I think it's, Islam is inherently a religion of peace. I think Islam is a religion. Mm -hmm. And I think that actually, like all religions and any religion, it can be interpreted to be anything the follower, the Muslim, wants it to be. Um, the reason I therefore say that by definition today, if that holds true, it has to be a religion of peace is because simply because the vast majority of Muslims are not jihadists. Mm. If the vast majority of Muslims were jihadists, I'd be forced to conclude it's a religion of war. So it's actually, I define Islam by what its people hold it to be. Uh, and that's slightly different to saying it is in essence a religion of peace. Mm. And the disagreement that, that, that Sam and I began with is that he was saying in essence it's a religion of, it's a warlike religion in origin. I think, I think through our dialogue he shifted his position to, to, to where I am. I think that's something he has uh, that we just had a uh, public discussion around the book in, at Harvard University. And he began, he kicked off with that point and said, actually, my views have been moderated since this dialogue with Majid. So he, you moved him a bit towards your view on that. Yeah. What did he move you towards? I have, in the last five years, um, uh, both in my dialogues with Ayan Hirsi Ali and Sam Harris, um, I have developed a lot of clarity on some of those issues around uh, what, what, what is represented by a maxim I came up with eventually. And that maxim is that no idea is above scrutiny and no people should be beneath dignity. Mm. And what I mean by that is um, we must uh, jealously guard our freedom to, to challenge and to scrutinize uh, and to even satirize any idea. And a religion is an idea like any other. Mm. Now, that's very different to picking individually on Muslims, you know, attacking a Muslim woman for wearing a headscarf or a man for having a beard. That's anti-Muslim bigotry. And so a people, Muslims as a people, must remain uh, dignified and, and they must, we must uh, preserve the dignity of Muslims. But that's very different, as I said, to scrutinizing ideas. And I've developed that clarity and that distinction between those two over the last five years through my dialogues with people like uh, Ayana and Sam Harris. Look at the monitor over my shoulder because we're going to play a clip from an sure. interview I did in the past with Ali al-Rizvi. Mm. Uh, you and Harris both mention uh, him in the book. Yeah. This was on uh, a program we did this past spring on interpreting the Quran. Mm. Let's roll the clip, please. There's this quote that you know I have that I like to say uh, when I talk to a lot of sort of progressive and moderate people who want to reinterpret the Quran in a way, and that is, put down the Quran and listen to me. You know, and that, that's the idea that a lot of uh, a lot of the interpreters, you know, for instance, who are all supposed to be fallible, they're all humans. Um, they will often be they'll like do anything, anything, just don't read the Quran literally. Like the words of God, the way that they're written, just don't read them that way. And I understand why they do that because in a lot of ways, it's terrifying. And that is what a lot of these militant groups are quoting. You can't say that's not Islamic. Don't read the Quran literally, yes or no? Yeah, no, absolutely don't read it literally. I've got a lot of respect for Ali, in fact. And um, 
uh, on this point of whether the, the question, I think the deeper point there he was making, and, and he and Sam are of like mind on this, is whether the literal reading of the Quran is the violent reading, and whether moderates uh, are, are engaged in a pretense, um, which ultimately they have to be engaged in, uh, to push forward a, a, a peaceful interpretation. And that they encourage that peaceful interpretation, but they want frank uh, candor in admitting that it's not a correct interpretation. And I have a slightly, a slightly adjusted view to that. I, I, I don't think there is a correct interpretation. Uh, uh, and that I think it's as wrong to say that Islam is inherently peaceful as it is to say it's inherently violent. I think it's a bunch of texts like the US Constitution. And if you take the analogy of the US Constitution, uh, there are people that argue that um, for abortion rights, uh, from the same document, people that argue for the rights of life. Yeah, but they're looking for meaning in something that isn't specific about that issue. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Volume 9, Book 84, Number 57, in the Hadith, it says, whoever changes his religion... Kill him. Kill him, right. right. I yeah. mean, there's really no room for misinterpretation there in the way that there yeah. might be around abortion rights. So uh, how do you, how do you well, deal well, with that? Well, actually, there's a lot of room for misinterpretation there, and there's been a lot of misinterpretation there. Now, what I'm not saying is that that's an, what you've just read is an implausible interpretation. It's actually a very plausible interpretation to read that hadith and say it means kill apostates. And lots of Muslims do kill apostates. And in fact, there's a huge problem with apostasy laws across Muslim majority countries. What other interpretation would you come to? So when you take that hadith, the problem is about methodology, which is what the dialogue with Sam is about, is looking at that hadith without even bringing in other passages right now. The hadith in itself is illogical. Now, hadith as a source is the second source in Islam. The reason this hadith is illogical is this, whoever changes his religion, kill him, would automatically also apply to a, if you convert to Islam. Yeah, if you, come, if you be, f become a Muslim from being a Christian, mm. you've changed your religion. So the hadith on the face of it is against conversion full stop either way, which is why it's illogical. Mm. And so now we, need to, now we have that problem. Now we have a problem which is actually, if you're going to be literalist about it, I will push your literalism one stage further mm. and say, follow me in that literalism and accept that the hadith doesn't say either one. It's actually an inherently contradictory hadith. Now we have a problem of what do we do with a hadith that on its own doesn't make sense. And this is where interpretive methodologies come along. And we have to say, okay, we have to couch this with other supportive, supporting references and passages. Mm. Now, that's where methodology kicks in. Which passages do you bring in to support it? I would say, as somebody that doesn't want to kill anyone, I would say bring in the one that says, la ikraha fi deen, from the Quran itself. No compulsion in religion. Mm. To say, you know, we've got to temper this hadith with another. Others, like uh, the jihadists, would say, no, we're going to bring in the other, you know, uh, something about jihad and violence. And this is where it's, you know, to understand that is a bit like, um, interp I'm, a, I'm legally trained, so it's like you take the English common law. You can pull something out, but ultimately it contradicts something else in that very same source that has the very same level of authority. And so to reconcile those things in, in a process in Arabic which is called jamma, uh, uh, the reconciliation of, of religious scripture, um, is where the methodology kicks in. And that's why the dialogue I have with Sam is all about methodology. And I want to finish this point by saying one thing. A lot of people say terrorism has nothing to do with Islam. And this is where I agree with Ali. It's incorrect to say terrorist violence perpetrated by Muslims has nothing to do with Islam. Of course, they are citing plausible readings of scripture. It's also as incorrect to say it has everything to do with Islam. That's the other end of the extreme. I think a frank and honest approach to this would be to say that it has something to do with Islam. Not everything, but something. And not nothing, but something. And that something is the fact that these uh, jihadist terrorists do resort to a plausible reading of scripture. And the counter-narrative to that plausible reading isn't as strong as theirs. And part of the solution, yes, foreign policy is part of the solution. Yes, identity uh, crises are part of the solution that needs to be addressed. Also part of the solution is ideology and challenging their interpretation. Which takes us full circle to where, where I want to end off, which is you've now made it your life's mission to fight Islamic extremism. Mm. How do you do that? There are two ways uh, people have tried to do it so far, and both have been, I believe, have been counterproductive. Uh, I call that the law and war approach. Uh, no amount of uh, war is going to solve what is essentially an ideological challenge. Uh, we can't shoot our way out of this problem, and we've tried. In fact, President Obama tried even more so than Bush. Drone strikes under Obama increased rather than decreased. Uh, Guantanamo remained. Uh, uh, bin Laden was assassinated. Uh, you know, so, so we tried to shoot our way out of this problem, and jihadism metastasized. ISIS emerged. Uh, that's not a solution. Similarly, we cannot legislate our way out of this problem um, because if it is an ideological problem, you can't just make ideas disappear by banning them. So if we understand the nature of the problem, the only thing that I believe in the long term is going to work is a civil society struggle to redefine the social contract in Muslim-majority societies to one of small-l liberal democratic 
uh, values. And that's going to require social movements uh, of young uh, Arabs and young Muslims uh, challenging the Islamist narrative and advocating uh, democratic values and actually literally preaching those democratic values. That could take 100 years. It could take probably 50 years. Let's, I don't even really know why I say 50. Um, let's not forget that, that roughly 50 years ago, the, uh, the Nazis had taken over Germany and, mm -hmm. and the, the world had seen one of the worst wars in our entire history of humanity. And look at Germany today, receiving 400, is it 400,000 refugees? 100,000? Oh, double that. Yeah, so 800,000 yeah. refugees. Yeah. I mean, there's a huge difference in German culture. Um, and that happened within a very short space of time. Uh, relatively relatively to, speaking. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Majid, it's awfully good of you to be with us here today at TBO. You've given us a heck of a lot to think about. And uh, we wish you well with your Quilliam Foundation and your new book, Islam and the Future of Tolerance. Thanks so much. Delighted. Thank you very much. Author Majid Nawaz from September of this year. In 2011, the federal government launched a $10 million initiative to advance its understanding of the causes of terrorism. As part of that project, the Mosaic Institute released a study examining the perceptions and reality of imported conflict in Canada. In Season 8, we invited representatives from the Mosaic Institute to our studios and asked, to what extent do residents from conflict zones bring that tension with them? And joining us now to help answer that, Rima Burns-McGowan. She's a professor of diaspora studies at the University of Toronto. And John Monaghan, he's executive director from the Mosaic Institute. They collaborated on this study, and we're happy to have both of you here in our studio tonight. Thank Thanks, you. Too. Okay, John, start us off here with the background. How did you put this study together? Well, <clears throat> it started with a conversation between the Mosaic Institute and the folks at Public Safety Canada who uh, were looking for research proposals related to the topic of how to prevent and address terrorism in Canada. And we were interested, but didn't claim to be experts in terrorism. We do have a real interest and somewhat of an expertise, though, in social cohesion and how Canadians get along with each other. And uh, so the proposal that was ultimately accepted was one that would look at how this phenomenon if it is one, of imported conflicts, affects the cohesion between Canadians, how they attach to each other and attach to Canada. And whom did you talk to, or how did you decide whom to talk to? Well, the, there's a terrific team at Public Safety Canada that heads up the Kanishka Project on behalf of the Government of Canada. Although there are many other agencies and departments involved in the project, they just happen to be the point of contact for organizations like ours. And Rima, what did you find out? Well, the fascinating thing is that most Canadians believe that people who come from conflict import it with them. But the fact is, we do not import violent conflict to Canada. We did extensive one-on-one um, -on -one interviews with 220 people who come from eight different conflict-afflicted regions. And we talked to people from all sides with all different perspectives, people who are deeply invested in conflict every single person to a person repudiated the use of violence in Canada to resolve the conflict back home for two reasons, both because it's morally and ethically wrong and because they do not believe that it's going to advance their cause. And this is even people who think that militant resistance to something back home is all right, but here it's not. And that is the single most powerful finding. There was a lot else, however. We found that we don't import conflict, violent conflict, but we do import trauma. And untreated trauma is a real problem. Then as well, we also, the darker the color of your skin, or the more, as I say, that you perform your identity or your religion on your body or your clothing, the more likely you are to face systemic racism. And systemic racism is obviously a problem in and of itself, but it also serves to re-traumatize people who are already trauma traumatized. Lots of things to pick apart there. Let's start with this. My hunch is people are under the assumption that the conclusions that you came to aren't the case, right? People assume that they bring their conflicts with them when they come to Canada. So we're, uh, how surprised were you when you found out that wasn't the case? Well, l let me say first of all that in addition to the 220 interviews that Rima alluded to, we also did an online survey of Canadians. So we actually asked them what their perceptions were. And, and one of our surprises was how enthusiastic Canadians were to respond to the survey. We had, within very short, a very short period of time after releasing the survey, about 4,500 respondents uh, completing a survey 
explaining to us what their perceptions of imported conflict were. And uh, when we analyzed those findings, we found that about 57% of Canadians think that other Canadians that come from uh, conflict aff aff afflicted regions of the world bring with them the sorts of tensions that could erupt into violence here in Canada. So the fact that our, our study uh, has determined that in actual fact that isn't the case shows that there's a, there's a really important distinction between the perceptions of Canadians and the reality of those people that actually come from conflict affected regions. But let's, uh, let's push this a little further. Reba, let's pick a region. Pick a region that has a conflict that where you spoke to somebody. You pick a region. Which one are you most interested in? I mean, do you want to well, talk about the Middle East? Let's for talk for, for argument's sake. Let's pick the Middle East. Are you saying that if Israelis or Palestinians from the region leave there, come here, I mean, they obviously don't fall in love with people on the other side of the conflict just by coming to Canada, but what does the nature of their relationship to the conflict become when they come here? So here's what's hap what happens, and this actually happens across conflicts as well. When people come to Canada over time, they actually reframe the way they see the conflict. What tends to happen is that instead of saying, X group did this to me and my people, they start to say, hey, what happened to me has also happened to loads of other people around the globe. And it's not X group, and it's not all of X group. It's a particular perspective, a particular ideology, a particular interest group. So they start to separate the conflict from all of X group. And it actually allows them to have a broader sense of why it's happening, what the possible solutions are, and how to get there. And so, for instance, in this particular case, all of the Arabs we spoke to, Palestinians and Arabs, separate, distinguish between Jews on the one hand and people who are in favor of a country that preferences one ethno-religious group over others, which they see as so the they problem on the other. they make a distinction between Jews as a whole and the particular policies of the Israeli government secondarily. They absolutely they do. do. Okay. They absolutely do. You find that surprising? Um, well, I, I did I found I didn't find it surprising because I had had a lot of conversations be, with Arabs before, but I found it what I found interesting was how strongly people feel about this, how important it is and how it's Palestinians and its Arabs from other countries and it's regardless of how strongly they feel about the conflict itself. So p the point is, and not just with this conflict, with all conflicts, people remain invested in the conflict but at the same time they still reframe how they see it. Okay, obvious question. Do we know why? Well, we have some, some inkling as to why. Uh, we do some things very well in Canada. We don't always do a very good job at, at congratulating ourselves, but we should do a better job of that because multiculturalism as a policy that we've now had in place for more than 30, 35 years seems to work uh, to a, at least a certain extent. It's certainly imperfect in implementation, but the fact that in our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, Section 27, we enshrine the notion that our rights and freedoms should be interpreted in a way to support the multicultural heritage of Canadians. That's pretty amazing and pretty distinctive. Canada really, to the best of my knowledge, is the only country that explicitly does that. And then the fact that we have such a widespread formal commitment to recognizing people's human rights and pro prohibiting discrimination on all of the grounds that we take for granted in Canada uh, that cannot be taken for granted in most other parts of the world. Those sorts of structural uh, uh, elements of our society really do help people begin to reframe and feel included to a certain extent in Canadian society. I wonder, yeah, so yeah go I ahead. Just add, I think that the, the thing that I found was that the, the single most important factor is inclusion. So where people really feel that they're in spaces where they belong with people from other parts of the world and they see that there are 
different ways of resolving issues, that you actually can get along with people who are different from you, that more than tolerance, you go beyond tolerance to respecting someone who's different from you, and you can find a way to figure stuff out. That is really profound. And I think is this, so in spite of that racism stuff I was talking about before, this inclusion is working at the same time, and where it works well, mm people are going, wow, this is really transformative. So I think we really have to take note of that and as John said, start telling that story more loudly and figure out how to make it work even I, better. I hear you, but I wonder if this is, in some respects, not all that surprising. Given that if you're prepared to leave the old country and come here, in some respects, I guess your study indicated, you've turned the page in some respects. I mean, if you're really invested in the, in the crisis or in the war back in the home country, Maybe you wouldn't leave. Mm, not necessarily. No? A lot of people leave because they have to. A lot of people leave because they have no choice, right? right? Mm -hmm. They were chased out. And, and that's, I mean, this is where the trauma piece comes in. Okay. You know, a lot of people leave because terrible, terrible, terrible things happen to them and to their families. So they don't necessarily come having said, forget about it, I don't care. And I think one of the things that things that's really important to understand, and it's why this study is so robust, is we didn't only talk to the folks who don't care anymore. We talked to the folks who also who care a great deal. And even them. And even them. We hmm. talked to the folks who, who are deeply invested. We talked to folks who spend many of their waking hours um, working in one way or another to advance um, their cause, and they still feel that way. Well, let me give another example, John. And, and, and um, okay, I've d I, we've done enough programs here, and I've done documentaries in the past, whatever, on the uh, situation in the Balkans, as it was 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how many times I've talked to people from the region who were from there and who are now over here, and who still talk about what happened in 1389 on Kosovo Polia when dot 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 one side did something to the other side. Mm -hmm. uh, People aren't just going to forget 600 years of history of how you done me wrong, Absolutely. right, when they come here. And, and you could replace those those proper nouns with other proper nouns sure. to talk about other conflicts. And absolutely, I mean, just to, to speak personally for a brief moment, when we did a soft release of this study, it happened to be St. Patrick's Day. Well, my name, Monaghan, is as Irish as Patty's pig. And, mm -hmm. and I was asked why there wasn't uh, a study of the relationship between Catholic and, and Protestant uh, Irish in, in this report. And there absolutely could have been, because I know from my own family story, that uh, the residue of conflict stays with you and it, and it transcends generations, absolutely. So as Rima said, people do remain invested in their conflicts, but how they act out that investment and how they act out their, uh, their uh, sometimes their animosity towards people that were at one time their antagonists, that changes dramatically through this reframing that takes place in Canada. Okay. And I think it's also important just to point out, Steve, that, that there's a values acquisition that happens. When, what does that mean? Uh, means that when people come to Canada, they, f in fairly short order, uh, adopt... Uh, buy in? Buy in to the values that many of us take for granted. They buy into the, the, the human rights regime, they buy into strong rule of law, they, they buy into the notion of a vibrant democracy where everybody can participate equally. They buy into that and in fact the survey part of our study shows that there's virtually no distinction in terms of their, the, fir the first generation's commitment to these principles and those of the, of the second or third generation. In fact, sometimes they even hold these values more strongly hmm. than third generation people. And in fact, here's another finding that came out that was really interesting, wasn't something that we were expecting or even looking for, but it started to come out so strongly that it was impossible to ignore. And that's the fact that a lot of times, not always by any means, but s significantly enough that you could really see it happening, when people come from trauma, one of the ways they deal with trauma, because people don't get adequate therapy, and, or, and certainly not a community appropriate therapy, so one of the ways that people deal with it is to become more um, observant in their whatever faith it is that they, mm -hmm. so they become more invested in that faith. But they don't become more traditional. They don't do more of what grandma did back home. They actually re-examine their faith in the context in which they live. And what is really interesting is that as they talk about it, they map onto what they see in their faith 
Canadian values. So respect for everybody and inclusion and you know even people I don't agree with and so on. And it's really interesting to watch that happen and it is a, um, sort of an incorporation of what we would, would call Canadian values into the faith and a mapping of these two things together. And this happens across the board. So the, 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 often we talk about faith as though if someone is being religious, they're somehow rejecting Canadian values. In fact, the opposite is true. Hmm. Can this help us understand terrorism better or deal with terrorism or affect terrorism? If you're going to understand yeah. what it is, you have to understand what it's not. And it doesn't help us to stigmatize and discriminate against and push away any group of people. So yes, once you figure out what's not going on, then you can start to understand what is. And I also think, Steve, that it's important to remember that public security, the safety of Canada, demands a holistic response. So when we think about making Canada safer, we need to think about economic inclusion. We need to think about educational opportunities for everybody. We need to think about... Uh, Getting rid of the systemic racism that I was talking about exactly. because that stuff's dangerous. It is dangerous and there are public safety implications to those sorts of, of elements of Canadian society. So uh, we should not think of public safety just in terms of thickening the border or thickening the walls of the jail. It's far more uh, uh, it's far broader than that. Gotcha. And we thank both of you for coming in and sharing your views on it. From the Mosaic Institute, Rima Burns McGowan, also the Professor of Diaspora Studies at the U of T, and John Monahan, the Executive Director of the Mosaic Institute. Thanks much to both of you. Thank, thank you, you so much. And that is the agenda for Wednesday, November 18th, 2015. Tomorrow on the program, thousands of children in Ontario are crown wards. In other words, the government is their parent. We'll take a look at what life is like for them after they leave care, and we hope you can join us for that. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at TVO.org, and we'll see you again tomorrow. Funding for The Agenda with Steve Pakin is provided by Ontario's more than 80,000 chartered professional accountants. Public policy leaders since 1879. More information is available at cpaontario.ca and by contributions to TVO by viewers like you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.